be a full screen thing on this. How about that? We do, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this will be repeated. This contact information will be repeated at the um, at the end. I'm not sure why I have Ohio things on there, but oh, they did a field guide based on our field guide. In any case, what I want to talk about today are relationships between plants and bees. And I'm going to emphasize the relationship that's very specific. In other words, bees that are locked in, so to speak, to collecting pollen from only a single plant sometimes, but sometimes a group. So these are the bees that are often the ones that need our help the most, but are not really incorporated. That thinking is now only just being incorporated into plans of what should we plant for bees? You know, what are, what's a pollinator garden? What are those plants? A lot of times they're just convenient plants that have a bee on them. We'll talk about that. So I first need to talk a little bit about honeybees. Anyone interested in a lot more detail here can email me and I can send you literature and, you know, more stuff probably than you want about this. But um, I just point out that our wild bees, which is what I'm going to emphasize here, are not at all like honeybees. So culturally, we know honeybees, we know a lot about them, but everything you know about honeybees, none of that, essentially, really all of it, none of that occurs in our natives. So there's your um, lecture about uh, the native bees. They are not honeybees. How about that? Honeybees are very cool, but ecologically problematic. Um, ecologically, everything is pretty much negative for um, native bees. There's no also benefits to our plant communities and things like that. They are cool. They do produce honey. Native bees do not. Another, you know, things that honeybees don't do, um, or hunt that native bees don't do, that honeybees do. And, um, you know, they they make cool animals. But if the reason you're promoting honeybees is because you think they're helping out, that would not be the case. So Brendan, I hate to say it, but you should have let them spray those honeybees. But that's not my place. No value judgments. Um, so um, let's look now about uh, getting into some details here about how you in your plantings or what you encourage to grow is going to support native bees. And there's a, a notion that I want to return to a number of times is that um, flowers are complicated um, in terms of their uh, support systems for different species of bees. And so planting, um, you can't check the box like now we've helped everything in the bee world by planting a set of flowers that do attract bees. It's more complex than that. Nor can we save birds by setting up bird feeders. Exactly the same idea. You get more birds, you get more flowers or more bees coming to certain circumstances. But if you really want to broaden that out to you know, very supportive. You both wouldn't be, from a conservation point of view, you wouldn't be feeding birds and you would be supporting native habitats in lots of different ways. Okay, so here's the biodiversity of the area in a nutshell. I'm using Maryland as an example in terms of the figures, but think about it. You're sitting in a place that um, had uh, evolved over billions of years, the continents when bees were first being worked out with plants was we're all together like it was one big smush of continents that's a long time ago when's the last time you saw a continent move so the answer is this has been around for a long time it's complex complexity is baked into the system it's unique we have as the other speakers have been saying we have our regional plants and a regional um you know faunas but we also have uh, floras that are in relationship to many of our invertebrate faunas. Yes, I gotta get those straight. But anyway, um, so it's complicated and just a little soapbox here, your house, your driveway, the sidewalk in front of your street, your street are all negative, right? Nothing, no native, nothing in those areas. Um, so you can look to your yard and other places that you occupy is like, well, what? What can we do to um, recover, repatriate some of these communities? And you can do a lot because insects are small. They're not bison or wolves. Um, so bees don't know these boundaries and are more than happy to move into your yard if you so desire that and create the space for them. So here's the nut of the 
um, lecture, really, which is diversity of native plants, I would say blooming native plants, um, equals a diversity of native bees. Um, if that's all you take out of this, that's great. Um, you like details, we can go details. Um, but um, when thinking about what I should be planting, then you want to err, err on the rare, uncommon, um, local flowering plant side of things that isn't planted as much because that's going to probably be more supportive. Now, we will get into details too that are delicious. I just want to pace through here. Look at these different designs. If you wonder how many kinds of bees and what kinds of bees are around, you don't have to know all this detail, which is a lot of it's microscopic. I mean, these bees are often millimeters only in size. You just have to look at the flowers, right? These flower shapes are designed for specific groups of bees, sometimes other pollinators, but mostly I'm showing you bee plants and way different kinds of strategies and systems. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be these different colors. There wouldn't be different time periods that they would bloom. There'd be one kind of flower, one design, something like this that a child would um, draw, but it's not, right? So you know flowers, you know there's lots of different kinds of flowers. They bloom in all these very special, interesting ways. The answer is to why they are after certain pollinator groups. All right, we're gonna show something about bumblebees here for a second. Bumblebees are um, in the region are going to be the most Catholic of um, bee species. Why is that? In terms of their pollen preferences, they have to be. They're out in a few weeks now, and then they'll be out until November when the hard frost, hard freeze kills them. Um, so during that time, all kinds of plants are coming and going. They can't be locked into pickerel weed or whatever, like a lot of other bees are. Um, and then those bees just disappear until pickerel weed blooms again, as an example. So with bumblebees, though, they've got to be, you know, like we've got to try, have access to lots of things. So you would think like, well, okay, big deal. Any bl blooming plant is going to support the bumblebee population. And as an example, not as anything that you want to look at this particular plant list and say, well, those are, those are my primary plants. Um, but we are moving in directions where we will be able to tell you which plant species, which bees prefer, and you could then design around that. First avenue is actually going to be bumblebees because there's a lot of interest, don't have time, lots of interesting decline in other issues. And um, a lot of that, yeah, there's a whole aspect of it that has to do with the simplification or the dumbing down of our environments that are available to bumblebees. Your house is also a problem, by the way. All right, so what this is, we did pilot work last year, and I'm going to give you an email address and a couple slides where you can also participate in this very simple half hour walks wherever you want. Gardens are even are the best. And we are asking the question, where are the bumblebees uh, on that half hour walk? All, all the while documenting what plants are there. So we have a list of plants. These plants were available. Which of those plants did the bumblebees go on? Was it random or were there, you know, play favorites? Like they always are on this. So some complexity in here and there's a lot of different kinds of analyses, but what we did is we extracted the, we only, because we were figuring out how to do the system, we only ended up with 10, excuse me, only a hundred um, surveys getting done late in the season that we were able to use the data for, but um, it was still illuminating. So after some futzing around with our um, approach to analyzing this, what you're seeing here is a list of plants in bumblebee order. So these are the favorites per our analysis. And you see a score on the right-hand side that the larger the number, the more let's call it percentage of the time bumblebees were on that plant um, on average for surveys that had that plant. Okay, so what you see then is like bumblebees like, let's look at the top few, cup plants, short tooth mountain mints, that's muticum, bergamot, goldenrod, red clover. Now, we also, by the way, are including any 
plants. So both cultivated, non-cultivated weeds, all that is part of a bumblebee world. So we're interested in the fact that red clover, not native species though, has a fair amount, you know, 20, almost 25% of the time you're gonna get bumblebees on them if you have them. Um, species, um, and we would think about that in terms of how we would manage a landscape if we were doing it for bumblebees. Lots of detail I'm skipping out here. And it goes down that list. So I'm sure you're perusing like, where's my favorite plant and how does it come out? Oh, look, porcelain berry. Oh, interesting. It actually has bumblebees sometimes on it. And we go down to smaller and smaller numbers and it's like, oh, here we are, brown-eyed Susans. Well, it's had at least maybe one bumblebee on it, but it's not super high on that list. Um, uh, and then go down Canada thistle, um, white vervain, other things that, you know, without quantifying it, we might not know. But a big point is here is that bumblebees don't do this randomly, right? They don't go like, okay, well, any old flower is fine. It's like they have clear preferences. And if you want to um, grow plants for bumblebees, you would move towards those plants and away from these others. And then there's a whole series of plants um, in our very preliminary early analysis um, already yielding kind of some ideas that, okay, well, these plants never had bumblebees on them. They might be in a bumblebee planting list, but no evidence that they actually are lovers of yarrow, queen anne's lace, spurnweed, uh, daisy fleabane, um, you know, wood sorrels, pokeberry, these kinds of things. So this is where we as a lab are going. And I will just pitch, and so the illumination there is that Every bee, even the ones that use the broadest range of plants are still really picky, right? Um, they are going to dial one direction or another in your garden. And when we get down to the specialists, which we're now gonna talk about, um, it gets really picky. In other words, you don't have their plant, they are not there. Um, so um, anyway, if you're interested, you can also email me if you, uh, neglect to copy this down, you can email the project and we'll set you up to do these half hour counts. Non-lethal, don't have to know your bumblebee species. It is encouraged. We also include carpenter bees because they look like bumblebees and you need to separate them. And your garden is a perfect place to do that. But we also encourage natural areas and others to increase the number of plants that we're asking bumblebees about. Okay, on to the primary topic here. So someone might want to grab this or look it up on the web um, and um, put it into the chat so you don't have to, because there's a lot of things here that probably you would copy down wrong. Anyway, Jared Fowler has done this for the whole country. And what he's got is a list of plants and a list of bees. And the these are bees that we define as specialists. So these are family level and lower, sometimes one species of plant that, um, uh, that, that the bee is dependent upon. And so, so dependent that if you don't have those plants or that group of plants, those bees are not there. So here you clearly have um, a strategy to bring in biodiversity that is impactful, right? Because what you plant matters. Um, additionally, you might be like, oh, this sounds too complicated, or those are probably all rare plants. It's the opposite. You can't have a rare plant with a specialist bee because the system would wink out over time. It's just not sustainable. So it has to be a common group, common plant, big numbers somewhere to build into the system. And I'll show you examples where you plant it, they come. So this is a good list to start with in any kind of strategy that you might have in terms of plant choice and it's available online. Um, and also I should say, point out to people like uh, Ursanga's uh, wonderful or their associates, wonderful lists um, and strategies and other things. You take this data and incorporate that into those lists too, in terms of um, what might be planted for each of these ecotypes and regions. And any garden supply, it's, it's a open, open list, it's not a government secret. Okay, east of the Mississippi, about 770 species that we calculate um, in flux as to their actual number of bees, and about 30% of them are dietary specialists. So meaning, meaning that definition that we just talked about. These are the vulnerable bees, vulnerable bees. So if you just look at straight counts um, and ask um, 
where are the common species? The common species are the bees that have a greater range of floral um, preferences. Um, often they're semi-social, meaning mom and daughters kind of get together and build a warren of nests or something along those lines. And then you get more and more specialized. And as you do that, you just become less common because you're completely dependent on only one portion of the environment. Um, so here's an example on here. The left-hand side is Osmia texana, a very big Osmia, which you're familiar with as mason bees and you put out tubes and things. Um, but in the city, you're probably not gonna get this. Why is that? Because thistles are absent almost always. And you get um, groups of people who kill all the thistles thinking that they're all weeds. There are two species, Canada thistle and um, uh, what is it? The, uh, I forget, see, someone put it in the chat. It's the other thistle that are not native and invasive. And the native thistles are beautiful and um, to be encouraged to be planted. And they um, support all these uncommon bees. You know, you don't have thistle, those bees are gone. And it's not just that one species of Osmia, there's a whole series of, of an eclectic mix of different bee species. So um, one of the things, particularly if you start delving into that list that Jared put out there, you had reading up on things, you'll find that it's, you know, there's no particular pattern in some cases of as to what's a, going to be supporting a specialist bee. Um, and some are pretty surprising. Daughter is an example. Um, uh, well, I think mentioned that uh, interesting story. Pickerel weed I mentioned, willow, grass of Parnassus, and you can read on down that list, um, have bees that only go to them. And um, so really, you know, fascinating world. And they, they can show up in your garden. We can show you, so we'll talk a couple examples. Um, I just wanna mention that forests um, are harborers of many different kinds of native plants as Matt and others have talked spoken about. And they also harbor many specialist systems. So some of these um, things like uvularia down there in the um, left-hand corner has its own bee, relatively little collected, but around. It was described from Beltsville, um, uh, for example. And um, you have kind of two sorts of systems. One is an ericaceous shrub one. So that's in your acidic soils, often on the coastal plain, but we're talking pine, oak, um, hickory kinds of things. And often if they're, they haven't been disturbed in terms of a farm, you'll have an, an existing ericaceous understory. If they're recovering from farming or anything else, you probably have to incorporate that ericaceous understory. Your yard, may have residual trees, sometimes it does, um, and things, but a lot of times it doesn't. But you do have often, in particularly suburbia, you have trees around. So a lot of these kinds of plants that are found in forests will thrive in your yards and are actually super appropriate because you've got a lot of shade. But it's not absolute shade, right? A lot of um, Trees are planted, there's walkways, there's opens, there's the house, a lot more sun than in a closed canopy forest is getting in. Lots of opportunity to bring that in, and a lot of those plants are um, ones that support bees. Um, uh, these rare bees, too, these ones. Okay, so some examples. Willow, a lot of people are like, well, willow doesn't really have flowers, but it actually does and hasn't invested like other plants do in colorful flowers because it's locked in a great group of bees in long-term environments. And these are wetlands, right? These wetland areas are often at least, um, uh, you know, locally stable. They're wet, they're over the years. Um, willow comes and goes, it invades into the wetland as it expands and contracts. And um, the male and the female flowers, particularly the male flowers, um, which provide the pollen are, um, are there. And the bees come out when willow blooms, they forage on the willow and then they uh, create their nests, the females do. And then and when, when willow is finished blooming, that's it. Those bees have uh, gone through their life cycle. The ones that emerge are dead. And then the young um, go through their life cycle underground, sit there all winter till next spring. That's the general life history with a million variations of all um, native bees. Most of them are only coming out at a certain time of year when their plants are there. 
and um, systems vary. So um, a couple, you know, I'll give different examples. So here, uh, Mount Cuba, many of you have perhaps visited, worth, totally worth a visit. And what you have is a basically a forested, semi-forested environment that has been augmented with um, native plants, um, mostly, almost entirely actually until fairly recently, um, revolving around the plants themselves. But in the, the um, um, in that process, they were um, creating all kinds of good bee habitat. And on the left-hand side, you can see a whole series of bees that had not even been known from the state of Delaware. I should say that uh, Andrina pulmonii is on Jacob's Ladder, um, which is uh, uh, pulmonia rather than Greek valerian, which I don't even know what that is. But um, so um, incompetence on my part, I'd say. Uh, anyway, so, and Andrina pulmonii is a really interesting example. Jacob's ladder was planted. Um, these bees showed up. Pulmonii, Andrina pulmonii is a specialist on Jacob's ladder, but the nearest record, West Virginia, Ohio border. Uh, but it just shows that in between there had to be populations that didn't fly in from Ohio and stop in at Mount Cuba. But it's very, it was very rare, rarely seen, rarely discovered by bee people. And there it is, showed up when you planted it. And we can go down that list and see similar sorts of things. So again, pointing out you plant it, they will come. This was not a, you know, a refuge per se. And a lot of that was created rather than in place in terms of those systems. Um, golden ragworts have their own bee species. Here it is, Andrina gardeneri. Um, not all, but interesting um, within the, um, uh, Pacara, formerly Senecio, group, um, there are different kinds of uh, ragworts and apparently different sorts of flavors of attraction to Andrina gardeneri and, and bees. So that's another place for us and other people to study which of these are the ones attracting. Uh, a little story, this um, gardeneri is a rare bee. This nomata Seniciophila is a uh, bee but a nest parasite on other bees, super rare, hadn't been seen in decades. Um, we were at a, a defense site in Charles County, Maryland. I noticed um, after talking to them about plantings that they had a area outside of their fence that had been sort of let go, no plan at all. And But there was bunches of grant, uh, ragwort in there. I thought, oh, that's cool. Let's go do a little sampling. So we sampled. And what we found were, I'm um, like, hmm, I bet that's Andrina gardeneri. And, um, and then there were some nomada, which is a common parasite, it's not, would not be uncommon. I said, those, those don't look right, uh, but eh, it's probably, I'm just not paying attention to which species. So I brought it back to the lab. Turn out, nomada senesiophila, lover of senesio, hint, hint. And so it turns out that that species is the nest parasite of Andrina gardeneri, all supported by Senecio. And I don't know, I tell this story because I love that story. And this is what, you know, is one of my drivers is figuring these things out. But that all occurs without any permission from any of us. And that can occur in your backyard just as well as it can in, you know, a Department of Defense installation. Here's another one that does involve directly backyards, alum root, hookera, the native one. So hookera at the garden supply center is basically a bastard mix of European, probably uh, Carpathian mountain things and American ones sometimes too. They hybridize with that drop of a hat and they're great plants, they're tough. So they're planted a lot, but they don't really support um, our native bees because they bloom at different times of year. So um, that's that. But the straight species here um, has a specialist. There's actually a little clade of species that all, um, have a bee called Cledes zestivalis. And Cledes zestivalis um, was on a lot of groups like super rare bee. We need to see if it's even around anymore. Hadn't been seen in a really long time. And you know, got onto the state lists of things that might be extinct, for example. Um, but it also turns out that um, it's a hookera specialist 
And Hukura in its native habitat is sort of, oh, hangs out on cliffs um, and rugged land and uh, is innocuous in terms of its presentation amidst a million other kinds of plants and is just overlooked all the time. Um, and it turns out if the plant's overlooked, um, it's not big and showy, you know, go, oh, look at that hookera patch there, um, then you're not going to catch anything on it. And if you don't work over hookera, you're not going to catch the hookera bee, Calides vestivalis. So it turns out the longer, the uh, part of the story is that um, several people, um, people like yourselves have been planting Calides, I mean, hookera americana, and probably some of the other species that are also spring hookeras, but Americana is the most common one. You can see the distribution of Maryland on the left, and you can see that Cletes estivalis has only been seen in one county. But um, if we jump now to uh, Wendy Brister's yard, which is just across the border in York, Pennsylvania, um, and undoubtedly, but unbeknownst to any of us, has hookera probably somewhere in one of those little hills that are in the York area. Her yard, which is not like a, you know, it's not uh, like Mount Cuba. Uh, it's got some plantings, not big. They had a handful of maybe five plants of hookera americana. And she took a picture and said, what's this plant? I mean, bee. And I said, hmm, that bee looks like Cletes estivalis, but that's a super rare bee, you know, like you're not allowed to have that. And so I turns out I was in the area. So I went by her house and it was Cletes um, estivalis. And um, we've seen that now several other times where people's yard plantings of this hookera americana has these bees. So keep your eyes open if you plant this. And why wouldn't you plant this? Um, so uh, for example, that um, one in Cletes estivalis is, I think, from the Great Falls area, very rocky. So you have rocks on the Virginia side, and you probably could get a ton of Cletes estivalis if you just planted the right hookera. Um, and, you know, it's just as good as the hybrid blah, blah, blahs in terms of its being tough and presenting well. Um, chinkapin. Uh, interesting plant. So, and the pattern among specialist bees is that they tend to specialize on something that is either a perennial forb, lots of exceptions though, or a low shrub. You know, some, you have to ask like, well, these are, and they're in plant communities that stay around for a long time. So annuals, not so much. And interestingly, we know relatively little about it, but it doesn't seem like trees are in that equation and uh, lots of specialists on them. Willow, kind of a tree sometimes, but you know, most of them are shrubs. But um, uh, chinkapin, Castanea, same genus as our American chestnut, um, has these flowers, some bunch of literature argument, is that wind pollinated or is it insect pollinated? Um, and very clearly it's it's probably both, but with a insect, um, you know, propensity. And it also turns out that um, I found a little patch, um, this is one of them on the refuge, Patuxent, and in there, I was like, oh, there's, oh, I've never seen that bloom. So I'm just, I, I collected like five bees off of it. And in there was this bee, Andrina Rennie, and it hadn't been seen again in like eight decades. And the most recent record was in the 40s or something. Um, it turns out, long story short, is that it's a specialist on Castanea and probably, um, you know, greatly declined when all the um, chestnut disappeared, which was a dominant but late season bloom in forests. Interesting ecology, lots of specialization by many other insects. And, but chinkapin, its sister was still around and retained this population. And um, so all without our permission and all without anyone ever bothering to look at chinkapin. Um, and so here is another cool story. Then we like uh, started asking around like, hey, could you go to these um, American Chestnut Trust um, plots and look? And sure enough, there's Andrina Rennie back in the game. Uh, pickleweed, three species of bees from very different taxonomic groups only feed on pickleweed. To feed on pickleweed, which is out in the middle of water, you have to want to go out there 
there's pickleweed waving this big purple flag. Come on out away from the land because you have to go back to the land to nest. It's got a deep corolla, need a really long tongue. It's got weird pollen, got to have hooks on the, on the tip of that tongue, hairs with hooks to pull that pollen out. They all do. They have become so specialized, they can't use anything else. No prickerweed, three species of bees um, will not exist. Similar, ground cherry has a set of species. I think a lot of people consider it to be basically a weed. Um, you have a bunch of different species. Um, all of them at this point seem to be supportive of these um, bees, but we, we need to do that work. Um, so um, now Chinese lanterns, non-native Fasalis thing that a lot of us have planted in the past, not clear. Tomatillo, which is a Fasalis, um, has records of these bees being on it. It is a Mexican species. Um, and, um, I just will argue, um, and we're planting them in planters that this is an overlooked, beautiful plant. And I like its form. I like the flowers. They're, what is that? Decumbent. So they're not as obvious, but you know, let's work with that. And you plant it, they will come. This bee is actually pretty common, but very rarely seen because nobody looks because, and we know that because when we do find it, we do find the bee and that plant is relatively common in the area. Now, a system that we're a little more concerned about are the native Lysimachias, not the um, loose stripes such as purple loose stripe or garden loose stripe, which are invasive and non-native, but the natives, there's a whole series. Um, they are supporting bees because they produce oils rather than um, uh, life, uh, nectar, I think. They might produce some nectar too, but it's basically an oil system. So these oil bees, Macropus, um, only go to this plant because they have decided in their little evolutionary minds that we need to have oil to feed our babies. So um, there's a lot less um, loose strife around than there used to be, and there's a lot fewer of these bees around. So here's an example where plantings of loose strife could be a positive. You have a lot of fall composite things from golden rods to the helianthus group that support um, a large list of things like Andrina helianthiformis. Um, and again, a fairly long list of bees that specialize in there. We could spend days and days talking about just the um, fall composite groups. Evening primrose, why does it bloom in the evening? Because it has bees that only go to evening primrose and they only come out in the evening after the other bees, i.e. their competitors, have gone to bed. And they have weird things like super gummy pollen with thistle threads that are connecting them and they have to modify their um, pollen collecting hairs to accommodate this weird gummy stuff. Um, so cool, morning glories, same thing. I'm not gonna show any pictures. Another whole set of bees only come out in the morning, only use morning glories. Um, and some of those bees have actually translated to the non-native bindweeds pretty well. But uh, Ipomea pandorata, that's a plus. You want to plant that wherever you can. Very cool plant. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, think moonflower, but native. Uh, white wood asters, another highly supportive group that blooms in the fall when, particularly late in the fall, when not much else is going on. It's a free plant, like wherever you go, you can get white woodland aster or white wood aster or the frost asters basically for free because they just come in, particularly the frost asters. White wood aster, maybe you should plant. Okay, so many more stories like that. Very cool. That's our, you know, lane for figuring those things out. You though, want to look at that list again, uh, my suggestion, but also, reflect on the fact that the current pollinator mixes are really geared towards um, easy production and lack of information by the producers in terms of doing that. So when you buy these mixes, you're getting who knows what. Sometimes you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, those mixes are mostly Cosmos and non-native annuals that boom, give you some flower um, right away. But in the scheme, you want to start thinking about replacing these, and you may have a hard time. Um, but other people, um, Nancy just talked about meadows, so similar things. We're working on that in terms of how to flip areas 
and include some of these less common plants. Um, so we're working, we've developed a little seed collective. Email me if you want to get information about this. And we're bulk stratifying things for planting in April, April 1. And we're doing this experimentally, but we see good results with that. But it requires someone, which we're happy to do, to do the stratification rather than, you know, doing fall plantings and using lots of herbicides. So whenever you hear herbicides, you should think, that glyphosate was initially patented as an antimicrobial, right? It's an antibiotic. So not good for the soil, lots of downstream problems with that. And so we're trying to de-emphasize doing your creation of pollinator gardens with um, herbicides, which is standard practice for large scale, um, uh, you know, conversions, let's call it. Um, so, and any planting, emphasize your specialist plants. Um, Everything is, you know, these are the rare bees. Um, the, the generalist bees are going to be fine. They're gonna use your specialist plants and you will undoubtedly have other things like um, the mints and uh, things that are supporting lots of things. An example, like even there, right in Alexandria, there's Dyke Marsh, which is basically a combination of old dump and old gravel pit in the water that is recovering from that. And Park Service has been doing a good job, but still it's surrounded by urban areas and was super beat up. And um, yet people, you know, did some, looked there some on some of these uh, plants and did some collecting intensively. And there are like globally rare bees coming out of that plant. The bee on the right, Nomada electella, is um, was unknown in terms of the male. There was a handful, literally a handful of, of specimens. And there was um, in Dyke Marsh, a whole long series of males. And we were able to you know, add that to what we understand to be that species. Why were they there? Who knows? But it may just be that a lot of these bees are much more common than we think. Um, would they move into your neighborhood? Sure. They're not gonna redline your neighborhood because you know, people live there or something. You've got to plant it though. So think of your neighborhood and your area, your region as a conglomerate of patches of, of native uh, introduced cultivated plants. The more you can introduce into both your yard and into the, the regional neighborhoods, the more it becomes a, a system that is supporting of some of these uncommon uh, bees and plants. And because we subsidize our plant communities, it often can be extremely rich, right? We're gonna water them, we're gonna tend them, we're gonna pull out the weeds. So these can be actually significant. On the negative side, I'm not gonna talk about it, but you know, your mosquito um, spraying programs, particularly the ones that go house to house, Mosquito Joe and um, Mosquito Patrol, those kinds of things, that's all negative. Uh, they are not, they have no capacity just to kill flying mosquitoes. It kills everything. I could, I'm going to stop. Um, so here is um, my guest house where I live now. And um, uh, it is um, surrounded by an acre of formerly when I got it was all lawn. And um, I flipped it. Um, and so I'll tell you a couple techniques. Uh, but what I'm doing in my approach, which is rural, so no one cares what I do, um, so I can get away with a lot. I do a lot of experimenting and trying, but I'm just using a, uh, I have no lawnmower anymore. I'm just using um, uh, string trimmers and ones that I can put brush blades on and I just edit out what I don't want. And then I will use mulch, which I will show you here. And we do this a variety of ways um, within more um, neighborhoods and things. You can't do some of what I've done everywhere your front yard at minimum has to be um, trimmed and people have done studies of this. So basically if you present all your man-made features like traditional landscape plantings around the house with mulch, um, your sidewalks, your front yard, your driveway, your neighbor's fence line, those kinds of things are all trimmed nicely. Whatever you do to the interior of that is considered to be okay, even if they don't understand it. It's because you clearly, are doing this one on purpose and two are taking care of it and have um, you know at least some handshake um, with the neighborhood 
um, there. So that's that's my little lesson. Um, so flipping things. Um, so you want to plant these things, right? So I will also mention that our laboratory now has moved more and more into growing native plants because we need them for our plant studies. And we're installing a hoop house, for example, next weekend. And we have irrigated um, um, uh, uh, seed growing beds and we've got irrigated grow out places. And we've opened this up to communities who are interested in growing odds and ends native plants, particularly the less ones not available. And we'll give you space. We're not going to, we're, we'll, do, we'll do the watering because it's all automated. Um, you do the schlepping and moving around and we have tools and you know more advice than you probably want. And we have large walk-in coolers that we can do the stratification. And we often have leftovers from our growing out that you can be potted up. So contact me if you're interested in that. And then we also just can, you can just come and um, see how that might be replicated. But our, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. So we're, we're doing a lot and we're involving the community as much as possible um, in that because we, you know, we have that capacity to do so. Um, so here is an example. This is the septic field. When I came in, it was basically an industrial area used to grow cranes. Um, it uh, had an industrial garage. You'll see a picture of it. And the land was just turned over and mowed once or twice, once maybe a year. Um, and the reason was the cranes, the endangered cranes there were very flighty. So it was like every weed that you can think of, every invasive woody plant is there. So we have a great place to do experiments. Um, inside, we have no deer. Outside, we have lots of deer. And we're looking at that uh, too. But where we grow things, no deer, really important. So basically, our approach is you take a site and you can do a couple things. One is you can just weed whack it to, to heck on down. That's all we did here and dump a lot of mulch, that chip mulch that Nancy mentioned. So we do, we're talking eight inches plus because we don't advocate for putting down cardboard or newspaper because that prevents the oxygen flow. The wood chips, um, we also don't really tell people to um, uh, dig up their soil. Um, so what's gonna happen is the wood chips are gonna foster the fungal um, communities and the invertebrates below that. And then your plants that are planted in there are going to open up um, channels of all different kinds into the soil. And together, it's going to essentially fluff that soil up for you. You don't need to dig it up, fluff it up just to have it compressed later. That community will do that over time. The chips also mean like last year, we did no watering whatsoever um, in these areas. And um, they suppress the weeds. Um, but not all weeds are suppressed. So if it's a woody plant or a perennial, like your perennials will over time, it will punch through. And we'll talk about that in a second. If it's Bermuda grass, all the other grasses can be just um, buried and they are gone, not Bermuda grass, um, as you might suspect. Uh, but you know, you're on mulch, you can find them, you can pull them, or you can use a couple different tools. And you plant right through to the soil without leaving a little crater around it. Um, and almost instantly you can have, if you're using plants, you're not using seeds, um, a pollinator garden. So here's our garage, um, which we love, um, and we can do whatever we want. And that area um, in the back, which is just a mass of flowers, um, is that same site two or three years later. And what, um, it was so successful, and we planned so poorly in getting access to the interior. We actually tore all of it out this year and replanted it with paths because we're doing studies, right? So we need to get in there. Um, and we've expanded our beds all over the place. And again, you can help um, if you're interested in that and growing things. So um, here's an example. This is a gravel parking lot. You can see the gravel and you know the mowed areas to the front and the uh, but we, it was unnecessarily have all that gravel parking area. This is to the entrance um, to the B uh, lab. And we simply buried, you know, mowed it, buried it with tons of chips. Um, 
dug out things uh, if they needed to or pulled things as they came up if they were weeds. Um, and then we planted right through it. This is the same, is, I think it's either the same year or the second year. I think it's the second year after. So you can get a really good response and it's very little work. So my tool, instead of a lawnmower, consider just having a nice weed whacker. You can get four cycle ones. Uh, we have a Makita that works really well. That's using, and um, another one, I can't recall the name, um, that uses straight gas and is not a oil gas mix. Um, you can put a brush blade on these and you can then lay out all your, um, your plants at the end of the year to open up uh, the cuttings and do your cleanup. Um, you, you can use them as editors. So you see a little maple seedling or something coming up or blackberries. Um, you can just spin that baby on its side and just buzz them down to the ground. Yes, you could pull them or dig them out, but will you? Probably not. But you're going to be um, mowing with your weed whacker, your edges and your beds and your paths. So as you do that, it's just super easy to lean over and get in there and take care of some problems. And also can be your editor for like, oh, those plants are getting out of control. I'm gonna knock them back. Um, I will, this is something we discovered recently and it's been actually a game changer, very inexpensive, like 11 bucks. Um, you can find them in lots of different places. I think Tractor Supply is where I got this one. I have yet to break one and we're really using them. Very, that's very small, by the way, it's, in, it's a hand tool. And that end is, um, let's see, this end over here is very sharp um, compared to other things, which is basically the end of a piece of sheet metal. These joints are strong. I've never butted them up. I often will have two, one in both hands. That rake is good. I can pull it out, chop out invasives, um, dig things out. Great for like in your mulch because you can slice ahead of it, slice down to the roots, pulls right out and is fun. Why have a gym membership if when you can do this? So <clears throat> that's the end of my talk. I'm glad to take questions if we have time. Um, here's my contact information. Um, I'm not really good at looking at chats. So if someone may, um, can ask me questions, that's probably good. Or maybe the the moderator could. I'm not sure. Hey, uh, Sam, I'm uh, Sam I'll, I'll read the questions off from the chat. Okay, great. Um, uh, what about ground dwelling bees? Um, so that covers a lot. Do we know further information? Very general, very general question. Okay, so most bees, most native bees are ground dwelling. They live in the ground. Um, there is all sorts of speculation on how to create nesting habitat for them. At this point, I tell people don't worry about it because we really don't know enough. Uh, they will nest in piles of dirt. Um, so if you have a back 40 and you have some old sand and dirt, just leave it open and bees will, bees will move in. But they also like um, scrubby lawn. Uh, a very few will nest in mulch, um, some potted plants. Um, you get um, uh, a lot of activity uh, that, um, and if they don't find their exact spot, there's somewhere pretty nearby, they'll just fly to and make their nest there. So I don't worry about that. If you're talking about like, oh, I I'm, I'm, um, was mowing my lawn and all these bees came out and stung me, those are never bees. Those are always yellow jackets, which are, is a wasp. And um, in the spring, if you have loose sandy soil, sometimes loose mulch beds, um, you can get a bee, two kinds of bees, Caledes thoracicus or Caledes inequalis. Often on playgrounds, uh, you know, I've had numerous schools have called and um, say that their parents are freaking out because little darlings are going to get stung by all these bees. And that story is these are aggregating bees. So they're all solitary. The females are making their own nest. The males emerge first. And uh, the game for them is a newly emerging virgin female is the only mating opportunity. That's where all the mating occurs. So they have to fly over the aggregation constantly or their genes don't get passed on. So what people see are the males, which of course don't have a sting. And the females are very businesswoman-like and just are going out and a few times a day 
uh, make a trip back to the nest with pollen to create um, cells there. So you can lie down in the middle of these things and nothing will happen. But different people have different perspectives. Okay, so um, are bee houses a good idea or not? I'm seeing them for sale in various stores. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can't hurt. Uh, there's a sort of a subculture of people who work with mason bees. And I'm sure in the chat, people can add some information um, about that. Um, so a couple things. One is um, often there is a dearth of um, sites that um, stem nesting bees um, can nest in because we're too neat and tidy, right? So uh, we don't have a lot of old stems or things with beetle holes or whatnot are just removed from our environment. So um, there's sort of two classes. One is a hole in a piece of wood and the other is a, um, a hollow stem. Let's think grass stem, but it could be blackberry um, and a variety of things with a subclass of a stem that is broken. None of these bees can you know, bore into a stem uh, that is broken, but has pith. So some have to have the pith in there. Um, so a couple things. One, you can just take a drill, give it to a child and say, drill holes in everything in the yard. So fences, um, the porch posts, the rafters, the shed, and bees will, will nest in it. Um, you can do that um, with blocks of wood. You don't have to buy these homes. Um, there is a notion that you are building up pest populations. Well, that's always gonna be the case. There's always a bunch of other insects that inhabit um, the nests of bees. And the more you aggregate that and the more bees you have, the more they're gonna show up. I'm gonna say, don't worry about it because you can't put in enough nests to make it a difference one way or the other in terms of affecting the overall population. But it does give you opportunities to talk about bees they're not a stinging issue. Again, you can put them right next to the kitchen window. You can incorporate that into talks and displays. It's, you know, basically a good thing. And I wouldn't worry about the details. Hole in a piece of wood, can leave it there for years, add new ones, move them around. It's, it's fine. Um, you, you kind of answered this with planters, um, that they do, bees do nest in the soil of planters, but, um, uh, do container plants provide enough habitat to be of value to native bees? Um, the short answer is yes. So um, the so they're going to you, third story balcony. You'll get bees coming into um, your planters if you have you know the right kind of plant for them. They're they're good at finding resources, and then they're probably not going to nest up there, but they're going to go somewhere else. Remember, bees can fly and um, nest on the ground or nearby or whatever, um, but it doesn't, uh, so bees, one, very small, two, um, they are uh, exothermic, so they don't have to manufacture um, through the energy in their bodies, um, heat to keep their bodies warm, so their energy costs are very low, which means that to make a little baby bee, it doesn't take that much pollen, so there's a notion that, um, so for, I heard something recently, one um, an annual sunflower disc, you know, which is basically many, many flowers that are consecutively blooming in there that, um, that can support about over a hundred nests of um, a native bee that's about the size of a honeybee. So just one flower can, has enough pollen to do that. And so it's like a, an other, it's hard, it's, as you saw, flowers have all sorts of different configurations, but it just takes a handful of flowers to have enough pollen for a bee to make uh, a bee nest. Now they're going to make their own decisions and move among plants and things like that. But yes, one clump of daisies or whatever it might be that is useful to a bee um, will be supportive. And then when it's done blooming, they're, they're out of there. Thank you. Um, here's a question about string trimmers and distributing little bits of plastic. Is that a concern for you? Um, you know, uh, the plastic in the environment is something that you don't want to have happen, but um, it, you know, in the scheme of things, I don't see it as too much of a problem. Um, you can get 
string trimmer heads, you know, you can get replacement heads because a lot of them cludge up uh, that use chain or wire, but those are also roundly considered to be really dangerous, but you know, trade-offs everywhere. They look great on the videos. <laughs> yes, as, a, as an old maintenance guy, I had to do a lot of string trimming back in the day. Um, I think, let's see now, here we get, um, some are ordering mason bees with misconceptions they are helping nature. So could that, could you say that again? Some are ordering mason bees with yeah. misconceptions that they are helping nature. Yeah, so, um, so I'll, I'll point out that if you put out mason bee nests, which we have done in lots of areas, including Northern Virginia, within urbanized environments, a lot of the bees that nest in there are already not native. There's two Osmia cornifrons and Osmia taurus that are from Asia. Long story about how they got here, but they dominate that community of hole nesting mason bees in the spring in urban areas. So you could argue like I shouldn't put any up because I'm just adding more of these, but you do get some natives in there. And again, it's not like you, you can make that much of a difference at the nest level because there are literally trillions of bees in the state of Maryland. So, um, so it's okay. Um, I would generally, uh, so first of all, there's no need to buy bees. So, so you can buy bees, uh, these, um, uh, mason bees um, online and bring them in, but there's no need. You you put out the tubes and you will get them. Um, you bring in outside bees and you potentially, although I think some of these companies do a pretty good job of, um, you know, cleaning out um, disease problems and keeping things local and all that kind of stuff. But from a cost wise, you don't, you don't need to do that. And you're also, there's no particular benefit because the system is already, um, the system is already full of bees as much as it can or want be. There's no like, oh, you know what? Uh, my, no one, none of the bees can figure out how to get to my yard. So I need to bring them in. That is not the case. They're in your yard or not in the yard because of what you've put in the yard. Um, so it's more about plants than, um, you know, having to bring things in. Okay, we're just about out of time, but could yeah. you tell us about the specialist bee for yellow passion flower? Oh, okay, yeah, that's a, a, a neat one. And actually one I've been looking for, I'm not sure there's any records. Um, so I think, is that in Ornata, Passiflora in Ornata? And there's a bee, a very small bee that only goes to that plant. Um, and my colleagues in uh, like Mississippi, uh, we're in the native range of it. We just haven't seen the plant. There are records in uh, Virginia, Richmond area. Um, so it's something that I encourage people, not the big purple one, but it's the small, I don't, I may have the scientific name wrong. It's a small one. And so I encourage people to plant them in trellises and things like that. They're, I think a little more, uh, you know, less uh, out of control than the big purple passion flower, which is basically the big one. That's a native and is basically a carpenter bee plant. Really interesting architecture that they have all based on tapping pollen on the backs of carpenter bees. Okay, this is, uh, we're a little past time now. So this will be my last, my last question. Um, this is being recorded, so you folks will send this out later to folks to uh, catch up. But uh, so you get rid of yellow jacket wasps. Are they native, and do they pose any kind of threat to native bees? Mm -hmm. um, I don't get rid of yellow jackets. I just hope to find them before they find me. <laughs> so um, once, so the, the yellow jacket story. So they really are um, not going to leap on you from across the yard mostly you're, um, you don't realize that they're nesting in the ground and you literally are on top of them digging or with a weed whacker or something. And they're like, oh, we got a problem. We're going to have to take care of this guy. So if you have a five foot buffer around their hole, you don't, same thing with ball face hornets. Most of the time, the problem is you didn't realize that there was a ball face hornet net in your um, shrub. And then you start trimming it and they're like, no, we're going to stop you. Um, but if you have a five foot buffer around any of these nests, not a problem. Now, if you want to get rid of them, 
you know, mark where the hole is, which I don't recommend. I don't, unless it's in a place where there could be problems. Um, you mark the hole, um, you go back at night, you have a gallon of water, um, in that water is a lot of dishwashing soap, not foamy, but just in there. Soap is, um, kills bees, kills all insects. And you simply then very quickly dump the whole thing down that hole. Um, and then you can, if you, if you like, you can throw a big rock on top of it, but that should take care of it. Don't do the pour gas down it in the middle of the day and light it on fire. Then you have flaming, stinging things all over you. Guys do that. So I know most of you guys are more sophisticated. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, we, mm -hmm. We're getting a lot, of quite, uh, a lot of comments to say thank you for the great presentation. So we very much appreciate it. Good, um, good. session is going to close. And then at 1 o'clock, we'll have our last session. All right. Thanks. It was a pleasure. It's a great, great program, Sam. I appreciate right. it. Thank Thanks. you, Sam. Bye now.